welcome to the Evolving Digital Self podcast, where we explore the conscious use of technology. Listen in to hear thought leaders and other guests discuss the human relationship with technology and learning to thrive in the digital era. Hosted by the author of the international best-selling digital self-mastery series and being at work, Dr. Heidi Forbes Usta. Welcome back to the Evolving Digital Self podcast. Today, I am so excited to share with you one of my longtime personal friends, an incredible author, editor, journalist, and just all around adventurer excellence, my friend, Billy Swizzle. Welcome, Billy. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Thank you. You know, it's been so fun watching your career evolve, going from traditional media and journalism all the way into doing this incredible work online that you've really just evolved into this, you know, influencer who for us on the outside looks like you're having fun every single day of your life, which I am having fun. I am. It's, it's, <laughs> I'm not faking it. It's real. It's real fun. <laughs> I, I'm so happy to hear that. So happy to hear that. So I would love to hear, and I'm sure our listeners would love to know a little bit more about your journey. Can you share a little of that for us? Yeah. So, um, I am, I'm going to be turning 50 years old this year. So I'm part of the last generation that sort of grew up before computers were a ubiquitous part of life. So um, the my evolution in digital has come from, you know, not having a bank card and, you know, not having a personal computer and typing papers in college on a typewriter to, you know, learning everything about uh, the digital world as it's happening in real time, watching all of this stuff, sort of participating in it as it happened. And just I just so happened to start my career in journalism in 1995. So I got my first email address. I, I was a, a, an editorial assistant at Sail Magazine. Sailing I was, was a magazine about sailing. I was tickle pink to get the job. Um, it was a real job. I had been sailing for three years and didn't have any money. And um, was really kind of at that turning point in life where I was like, well, okay, um, I, I can't go to the beach anymore and I want to do something. I want to actually participate in society and give something back. So I lucked out and I ended up at Sail Magazine making $18,000 a year to uh, file slides. For those of you at home, before digital photography, there were slides. And one of my main responsibilities at that job was to to catalog the slides because um, each slide is a unique piece of art. You know, you can't replicate a slide, so they were worth money and all that. Anyway, um, so I learned how to write and I learned how to be in media, in print media. My boss had, didn't have a computer. He had a yellow pad, you know, he went out to martini lunches. He was the classic old media guy. You know, he founded the magazine. He was a legend in the sailing world for founding this magazine and building it up to what it was through the 70s and the 80s and into the 90s. But, you know, I came on board. The company had just started desktop publishing. And, I mean, prior, you know, several years before, they were still sending the pictures of what the pages were supposed to look like to the printer, and then there would be typeset and all that. So, anyway, I'm dating myself. But my point is, is that I started in old media. There was three magazines. There was no other competition. They had a monopoly on their market. It was great for me because I was on the inside. I was part of the in crowd being one of the few people to sort of get a job writing about sailing and having a large audience and all that. All the way through, I, I sailed around the world. I jumped out of helicopters. I went to Iceland. I, you know, I, I really, you know, I had a credit card. I had a business account. It was amazing. But, you know, fast forward to 2007. I mean, I can sort of tell you all about the fun stuff that I had. But in 2007, um, now I'm a senior editor of that magazine. I've been there for years. Folks at home, you know, most people don't stay at some place for 15 years, but I did. The crash happened. The, the global economic meltdown happened. And all of a sudden, the, the staff that I was at cut in half. Um, and I was sort of, I had dabbled in video. I had dabbled in the website that, Sale Magazine had been doing, but it was all very uh, elementary stuff. But I saw that for, for a couple of things I was intrigued by. First of all, um, as a print guy, the ability to write a story and publish it and get feedback in a, in, an, in, in a millisecond was revolutionary compared to the way it worked in old media, where you would write your story and you would send it to the printer and you would um, 
uh, wait uh, six weeks, and then finally the story would come out. So anyway, I loved the immediacy of being able to write something, post it online, and get immediate feedback. I also loved the ability to use the photos in my stories as well. So, you know, unlike old media, the writers write, and then the artists, the graphic designers design the pages, and never really the twain should meet. I love the idea of being able to not only write the story, but to to tell the story with the images as well and video as well. I was lucky in that I had exposure and contacts in that sailing adventure world. And it was just a logical progression for me to really start running with it on the digital side. So taking the, the knowledge and the expertise that I learned writing for print media, but using those skills and the digital world and then bringing in the video and the photos and I think the underlying reason why I did all that was because it was fun like it was exciting it was it wasn't like it didn't feel like work so that's kind of where I am now I used to write about sort of smaller sort of 50 foot boats now I write or cover bigger sort of super yachts I I go to Monaco and Cannes and uh, Fort Lauderdale places where super yachts are you know Arctica I've been to a, a million places um, looking for the really the the really exclusive things, the things that only a few people get to do, and I'm one of the lucky people that gets to do it, and then share the story easily and quickly via the digital channels. Does that make sense? Absolutely, and it's been fun to watch your journey, not just as your friend, but as a reader. And 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 it's not even reading anymore. It's you really feel like you're going along on the journey. I mean, yeah, good. Watching some of your great videos that you've done during the America's Cup and taking a ride on some of these things, you really feel like you're part of it in a totally different way than if you were consuming it via print in the old way. Which not that I didn't like your journalism then, but it's just a different experience as the person that's consuming the media. So it's been really fun to, to follow your journey there. Being an old friend of yours, I've also watched your journey, and you now have this amazing little boy who's been part of this journey with you. And, and I'm curious how you feel that your journey with technology and sort of integrating that into your life, because you're on the road a lot. Like, how do you use technology to enhance your relationship rather than become something that gets in the way because it seems like you guys have done a beautiful job with really balancing that and using it to your advantage. All right. So this is a great question. I love this question. First of all, thank you so much for kind of describing your experience with the work that I'm doing, because that is exactly what I hope to do. Uh, what I've kind of come to realize is that I'm not just posting selfies. I'm not just sort of saying, Hey, look at how cool I am. I honestly, I'm not. My true goal for the work that I'm doing now is to share the love, to really share the excitement and the fun and the sheer like, gee whiz, isn't this amazing that I'm able to do this? And, you know, isn't this amazing? Like folks at home, like, check this out. It's amazing, you know? And um, I, I just love like the ability to bring people along with me on the on these cool things, because honestly, it makes it more fun for me knowing that. Hey, I'm in Iceland drinking a Coke with a 2,000-year-old ice cube in it <laughs> that it was just falling off of a glacier. You know, I can share that with people at home, and they can get the, the experience of it as well. Because, I mean, part of the thing that I think is so cool about digital media is that it can go anywhere really quickly. You know, I can be in sailing 50 knots on a sailboat, and someone could be looking at it in their cube, in their work, and they can say, you know what? there is more to life than this cube. Maybe I can go out and do whatever it is, fill in the blank, you know? So if I'm doing that, I feel like I'm doing my job professionally. But, but people still hate me. People still say, oh, no, I'm not a, another 50-knot sailboat or whatever, but say la vie. And now my little one, Sam, he's five years old, and we have a very interesting relationship with technology for him, like in what his sort of parameters are. And I also have a, an interesting sort of ideas about how much I share of him with the people that I sort of work with. I've integrated my personal and my professional digital worlds. You know, my real name is actually Bill Springer. But I, early on in 2007, when I started my Facebook page, <laughs> I was actually in a very bad, like, dad band, you know? Like, I was the drummer in the band, and it was a very bad, but they wanted to have a MySpace page which was awesome. But I didn't want my worker, my, my employer to know that I was in this bad band. So I came up with Billy Swizzle as a, 
as a name to have for my Facebook page um, with the idea of having some, I don't want to say, I guess anonymity. I just didn't want to be, I didn't want to integrate my work life and my personal life. I wanted to keep them separate. I thought I needed to. And I came to the realization years later where it was like, no, this is who I am. You know, I'm in a bad band. I go sailing. I have a son. Um, I like to take pictures of my socks. I'm a very, I got a lot of good socks, you know, like, I just like to have fun with it, you know, and there's nothing wrong with it. If my employer sees that I have cool socks or that I'm in a bad band, it's no big deal, you know? So that was kind of a, a thing that I sort of came to realize. However, um, when it comes to Sam, he's five years old. I don't want to be exposing him. Uh, he doesn't have a choice of whether he's on the internet or not. I think that's up to me. And I, I take that very seriously. I do share with him, I share pictures of him occasionally because, you know, our relatives and our friends, they want to see the little Sam growing up, but I don't want to be just sort of spamming the world with, you know, home movies of my cutest, you know, the cutest person in the world who happens to be my son, you know? And I also think there's a, there's an element of, um, I wanted to, there's to be some privacy too. I don't want to be sharing everything about my private life. So I've kind of come to realize it. It's almost like a gut feeling of where is this appropriate to share and what isn't. It's it's kind of like a moral compass or a, some sort of compass inside that I that seems to work for me. That said, and just one other thing, like with Sam, he's five. He only gets two hours of iPad for us on Saturday mornings and two hours on Sunday. We've been really uh, conscious of how addictive it can be for ourselves and just for all of the reports that you see in the news. And I see how magic this little boy is and how completely mesmerized he can be by the iPad when he has it. So um, that's been a choice for us to really make it a special thing Saturday morning so we can sleep in a little bit. You know, he gets up and um, he gets his iPad and he watches Bob the Builder or whatever. And we get to sleep in and feel, you know, like, okay, you know, we're not total, um, you know, kind of making, making him miserable because he can't have any iPad. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a gut feeling, really, between what's appropriate and what isn't. Did that answer your question? I hope it did. It absolutely did, but I think the, the other piece that, you know, and just knowing you, I've seen this between you and Caroline, who I absolutely adore, uh, Bill's wife, for those of you that haven't been, or have been listening. She is the brains of the operation, by the way. She is awesome. <laughs> but anyway, I love when, when Caroline's out here visiting the way that you guys share videos and do FaceTime and really use it as a way to keep you connected when you are, you know, apart from distance from traveling for work, because you both do travel a lot for work. And it's really just such a blessing to see how powerful that tool is. So I think it's beyond sort of the entertainment value of something that I really, I, I just, I love the way that he's so comfortable with that. And he really, yeah. it's like, it's daddy time. Like, yeah, no, absolutely. No, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that because absolutely FaceTime has been a revolution for us. I mean, I, I was on a bike. I was, I, I ride from London to Monaco every summer. I know it's tough, but someone has to do it on my bike. I love it. It's just, it's, I look forward to it every summer. And my phone went off in my, my little spandex shirt and I pull it out and it's Sammy on the FaceTime. And I'm talking to Sammy, riding my bike through France while he's taking out the garbage, telling me how proud he is that he's filling in for me, taking out the garbage, you know? And it really makes the distance and the time away much more bearable. Yeah, it's crazy. It's like it can be obsessive and crazy and people can be bumping into each other because the phone is uh, literally plastered to their eyes. And then it can be this utterly magical family connection device all at the same time it's really kind of remarkable i think i mean it's just it's such a, a beautiful thing and, and i think we, we forget to acknowledge that piece of it we're very yeah to i agree judgment and talk a lot about sort of this addiction piece but it's not like the amount of hours it's amount i i do think that like what you guys have done with sam it's more teaching him that it's something that entertainment piece is something special just like when we were kids you know when we were kids and there was no internet to to sort of goof around on for many hours there's plenty of parents that just chose to use the television as the instant babysitter and and it's more about building those the you know the good routines and guidelines around it so that we don't get absorbed in that screen but but rather enjoy it for the value that it is it's a communication tool it's an entertainment tool and as you move on, it becomes other things in, as well. I mean, like when you travel. So 
you have this incredible supercomputer you carry in your pocket, right? What are your favorite apps or tools or things that you use it for when you're traveling? Because when you're on the go, I'm sure it's everything from, you know, your boarding pass to whatever. I mean, uh, you know, what 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 are your favorite things to take advantage of that supercomputer or health monitoring or whatever it is that you use? That's that's a great question. I mean, I'm using my phone to do this call. So, I mean, right there, I've got it set up to Zoom. I'm, I'm using the phone to do the call. The things that come to mind immediately would be WhatsApp. I do a lot of WhatsApp calls. I have a lot of contacts and a lot of interviews that I do with people in Europe and in Asia. And I don't even have an international call, you know, phone call plan. I mean, it's either a WhatsApp or a FaceTime or a Skype call. So, I mean, it's critical for me to be able to make those connections um, and do the interviews that I need to do, um, you know, on the very sort of basic communications level. Uh, I'm not like super into, you know, every app there is. I'm kind of simple when it comes to that. I mean, of course, I, I use the phone. I use the camera a lot. I use Facebook and I'm really getting into Instagram. I'm, I'm really seeing how Instagram is kind of the perfect uh, medium for me when I'm doing because a lot of the stuff that I do is so visual and it's kind of fun too. You know, I mean, I like to kind of have fun with it. You know, I mean, I'm not curing cancer here. You know, I'm, I'm kind of sailing on super yachts and, you know, riding bikes down French roads and going to fancy hotels, <laughs> uh, which is, you know, it's great. So I, you know, I, I don't really need much more than a really good camera I mean, I use the phone also for interviews. I'll re record the interviews on the phone. Yeah, I mean, that, it, it's really just kind of the basic stuff for me. Um, I'm, not that, I'm not that techie. Uh, I do have my blog, and I do have – I have used the WordPress app to update the blog and things like that, but I'm not writing posts on the WordPress app. I'm still using my desktop for that. Yeah, that's all that comes to mind for now. I'm sure there's more, but for now, that's about it. That's great. And I think that's a good little transition point. We're going to go to our sponsor and we'll be right back with more of Bill Springer, also known as Billy Swizzle. This episode of The Evolving Digital Self is sponsored by Good Idea. Good Idea is the Swedish sugar buster. It's a scientifically proven dietary supplement designed to go perfectly with any meal. The big deal is that Good Idea, the Swedish Sugar Buster, contains a blend of five amino acids and a mineral in sparkling water that helps those with normal blood sugar levels handle the sugar spike following a meal. And it works with any meal containing fast carbs and or sugar. That's why Good Idea, the Swedish Sugar Buster, might well be your best lunch date ever and the one you can have every day. Available now on Amazon.com. For more information, go to GoodIdeaDrinks.com. And we're back with Bill Springer from Ocean Media. Did I say that correct? Or a Ocean? No. Media? Well, I, yeah. So I'm I'm the editor in chief of Ocean Home Magazine, which is a luxury magazine that focuses on uh, high end real estate. Uh, on the coast, so uh, we do a lot of architecture stories, a lot of interior design stories, and um, I've been brought on to uh, kind of focus on the luxury element of things. So we do a lot of travel stories and uh, some lifestyle stories that I've just brought into the magazine. So we cover boats and watches and private aviation and cars and things like that. So that's um, kind of my day job. I'm also uh, a contributing editor at, or contributing writer, I should say, uh, for Forbes.com, where I focus on super yachts and luxury travel and things like that. I've been doing that for several years, and it's been really fun to be in that confluence between luxury products and luxury travel and yachts. You know, there's a really neat circle there that um, it's neat for me because I, I have a pretty good understanding of yachts and uh, I know all the players. Um, and it's just a logical progression to sort of be connecting the dots with those, both at Forbes and with Ocean Home. Uh, and then I also do uh, my own blog, which is Swizzle Media, and um, that's more personal stuff, but um, still kind of along the lines of, hey, check it out, isn't this fun to do stuff. You know, doing the, the role that you're doing right now, where you're checking all this stuff out that's really, really cutting edge, have you seen a big change in 
the kind of integration of technology into these super yachts and supercars in terms of, you know, sort of smart home elements, smart car elements, and sort of how has that changed the industry and the way people, the expectations people have? Uh, well, so to your point, absolutely. I mean, the technology, particularly in the yacht, the yacht business, it's important because you can't run a 320 foot long super yacht without technology. Uh, but the thing is, is it takes five years to build a super yacht from you sit down and you design what you want. It takes five years until the boat's actually launched. So you imagine the technology that develops over a course of five years. So one of the big challenges for these yacht designers is how to future proof a super yacht. You know, I mean, of course, it's got to it's got to have the very best in technology. Uh, but how do you imagine what the next five years is going to be and how do you prepare for that? So there, that's a big that's a big challenge. Things are always going to be um, more over the top and more, I mean, you know, indoor swimming pools, uh, the stuff that these yachts have now, uh, personal submarines, helicopter pads. I mean, all that stuff needs a lot of computing power. Um, and that's only going to increase. I mean, honestly, all that stuff is it's so far above what the normal sort of person can really sort of comprehend um, that there's whole teams of engineers and things like that to sort of run that stuff. Luckily for me, I'm more of just like, oh boy, this really is cool. Like, isn't it fun to sort of do this? And aren't these things that are so technologically advanced amazing to use? But I'm not the, really the expert on the actual technology of what's happening and where things are going. Well, but I think that you probably see that shift and maybe the type of ownership changes where because of the technology, you don't necessarily have to be a yachtsman. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. And that goes all the way down from a super yacht down to the more sort of conventional 40-foot boat that or or a car or whatever. Yeah, I mean, the, you push the autopilot, all of that technology that we see in our phones and everything like that is making making it easier actually for someone to sort of go out and buy a boat and to really enjoy it um, without really necessarily needing to learn as like I did by like making every mistake in the world and it took a long time to actually learn how to do. Do you see resistance in traditional uh, sailors or yachtsmen in terms of seeing this technology integrated in it's sort of but it's not the same. It's not a real boat. Or, oh, or absolutely. Not. Absolutely. Okay. So the America's Cup is a prime example of this. Okay. So the America's Cup for the last three America's Cups were based on catamarans. Uh, these boats are capable of going three, four, five times the speed of the wind. They're, they're, they're more like Formula One race cars than anything else. You have to be, it's a completely different animal than your conventional sort of boat that just sort of goes along. Um, and there's been a huge debate and there's been a lot of back and forth between it's not real sailing and, you know, this technology is making it too, too space age and whatever. And, and that's and it's swinging back. I mean, this next America's Cup is going to be is going to be a, a sort of a hybrid of um, this foiling technology, which is, for me as a conventional sailor has been fascinating. And the lucky guy that gets to ride on wearing the helmet and the cool guy sunglasses you know, it's remarkable, but I could never actually sail it myself. Like, it's so fast and it's so powerful, it's scary. There's only 20 guys that could sail a boat like that. But it's good to have the technology push the envelope to see where we can do, where we can go, and then the control of the technology and all that stuff will catch up to it. But yeah, the, the things, the, 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 there's always going to be that sort of, oh, things were cooler back in the old days, but, you know, the, the progress marches on. And that, and the people that don't adapt just kind of get left behind, you know. And that's the same for old media or whatever, you know. I mean, that's just the way it is. No, absolutely. I mean, actually, I was going to circle back to that question because I think, you know, have you found that some of your former peers from traditional journalism have just refused to evolve and gone into different industries? Or has that transition been fairly smooth? Well, you know, yeah, that's a great question because, I mean, absolutely there's been people that were the big man on campus when there was three publications uh, and no competition. But then when all of a sudden everyone can be a publisher and there's no sort of golden key that um, only a few people have to actually get their stories out, 
and then there was a lot of people that were just attached to the old way of doing things from a business standpoint. Um, you know, print media, there was a, just a big resistance because people couldn't figure out how to make money on the internet, you know, and they're still trying to figure out how to make money. But there is money to be made and there's stories to be told and it's, there's a really a rich experience, but it's not just like a cookie cutter, like, okay, you write the story, you sell the ad, and then you play golf on the weekends. You know, it's much different now. Uh, but you see it. I mean, there's companies that absolutely just doing amazing things online and making money online, uh, print, uh, the publishing companies, you know, so it's definitely possible. And for me personally, and I, and I do have colleagues that either just kept doing what they were doing or whatever, and they, 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 they have sort of kind of left the industry, you know. And, um, I mean, in a weird way, I mean, when I left Sale Magazine, I, I was like, oh, my God, that was like the best job ever. What am I ever going to do? And I've made that transition where the technology that actually, you know, led to me getting laid off because of the implosion of print media has been the absolute soil that I've planted this whole new career that's going to be that's been better than my wildest imagination. You know, so it's, again, that paradox of, well, the technology is wrecking something here, but it's providing uh, completely new and exciting and much more autonomous experiences and opportunities for me over here. And I know I'm not the only one that's experienced that. Absolutely. So I'm going to actually ask you a funny question, and I, I didn't prepare you for this one, but I know yeah, yeah. before kids, you and Caroline did this incredible sort of, it was like Amazing Race, but it wasn't the Amazing Race. Right. In Europe. And I, you know, I often think back on that experience and what you guys did and the struggles you had with, for example, uploading the videos, because that was part of the point thing. I mean, you can explain it a little bit better. Uh, have you ever been tempted to do something like that again today? And how do you think the experience would be different? All right. So, yeah, you know, that, that's actually I'm so glad to be reminded of that, because in 2000, uh, early 2009, I guess, or eight, um, when the sort of the, the real economy was melting down, both Caroline and I got let go from pretty powerful, high paying jobs because of just the, the trauma of the, the economic meltdown. So while most people were freaking out. Caroline happened to enter this contest to win some spots in this amazing race type travel where we went from one European city to another and we made videos and it, we had like a scavenger hunt and it was like a new way to, so it wasn't like a package tour, see Europe. It was like see Europe in a more of an amazing race type of program. And it was cool and it was fun. And, um, I was, I was calling it, um, the Bill and Caroline sort of stimulus package. Cause I mean, you know, here we are, <laughs> you know, everyone else is like, Oh my God, I don't have any money. And then we were like spending money like crazy going all around the world. I mean, we did have jobs waiting for us uh, when we got back. So we weren't completely foolish, but that said, um, you know, we, part of the contest was to take videos of ourselves to prove that we had uh, achieved these challenges. And then we would get to these old hotels with dial up Wi-Fi, and, you know, there would be, 10 teams trying to upload their videos to YouTube so the judges could judge who won that day's contest. And it just, it just didn't work. You know, that, that stuff today, I mean, I, you know, in France, I still kind of run into some Wi-Fi troubles, but, <laughs> but that's okay. I mean, that's, you know, that wouldn't be France without that. Yeah, but I mean, apart from that, I mean, it's kind of that trip actually kind of led to my sort of digital, I don't want to say persona, but just it led to my understanding of how, you know, sharing stuff online could actually be fun and integrating uh, other people in a way that would be, I'd like to say uplifting as opposed to just either selfie or depressed because someone was doing something and I wasn't. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as my good friend Simone often says, it's about increasing your having level. And that's part of what you're doing is helping people see that there's something more to look out there for. It's like you don't just stop at here. And it's not necessarily saying be sad about where you're at. It's more saying, well, wow, there's, there's, you know, there's something outside that window that if I just walk through the door and really, you know, look at that as my goal, I might be able to get there someday. And whether you're going to have a super yacht or it just makes you aspire to at some point learn how to sail, you know, it's just giving you something that's out of the box thinking for a little while. Not everybody gets to fist bump with, you know, the Prince of Monaco, but being able to at least think about that journey and smile watching you that's right. doing it, something like that. So I think that there's, you know, I, I don't think it's totally fruitless. And I think that you're, you know, you talked about not necessarily saving cancer, but 
you know, they talk a lot about mindset in cancer. And it's like, well, just reminding you there's something to live for, you know. So maybe you are curing cancer in your own little way. Well, you know, who knows? I mean, uh, the thing that I've, I've also sort of made a conscious decision is to, uh, when I'm inspired, to write about more personal stuff. Uh, not all the time. I mean, I, I don't write about politics. I don't comment about politics. Um, I don't really sort of post inspirational quotes and stuff like that. But when uh, the mood strikes um, or when I'm particularly grateful or something like that, I do. And it's a conscious decision to share more of my personal sort of feelings and emotions. Invariably, those are the posts that people really seem to like the most um, because it shows because I share the, you know, the, the struggles, you know, I mean, we all have struggles. I mean, I'm, I, I've had tons of struggles and to be able to sort of kind of put it into context of like stick with it and you kind of work through those struggles, you know, um, cool stuff can happen. And, and that's something that I could never do in print media. I mean, maybe I could, but it just wouldn't have the same immediacy. It wouldn't have the same impact or the reach. Yeah, absolutely. You said it quite well, and it, it's been powerful for me as your friend watching the journey, but I'm sure for people that don't even know you, that it's just, you know, it's inspiring and uh, it's exciting to see. And we all want to learn more from that and, and sort of get other ideas about how we can take ourselves out of adverse situation and, and move on and do something great. You know, it really comes down to it's not necessarily all about super yachts. It's about future proofing our own ideas of where we want to go and maybe learning how to use technology just enough so that we can get there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I look at it like uh, stories with soul, really, you know, whether it's um, going really fast on an America's Cup boat or riding up uh, Mont Ventoux in France on a cycle on a bike or um, going to Antarctica and like smelling how bad whale breath really smells, you know, so you're getting so close that like the, the, the spray from the whale, you know. You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a humanity there, you know. I mean, I'm in this world, in the luxury world, where um, there's a lot of status and there's a lot of money, and, and that can be a little bit weird. But deep down inside, we're all human beings. You know, we're human beings using technology, you know. If we could all remember that and to not take ourselves so seriously, we'd all be a lot better off. Absolutely, and that humanity piece is so important. And, and, and you, you brought up a little bit earlier the whole thing with gratitude, and that's something that I really appreciate in the way that you write, because you're constantly expressing gratitude for just being part of those experiences. It doesn't come as this sort of, hey, look at me, I'm so awesome. It's like, wow, I am so lucky to be part of this experience. And and it the tone of it is totally different. So it's really quite amazing to be able to read something like that without feeling diminished, but instead inspired. Kudos to you on, on being able to accomplish that. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I'm curious in terms of speaking of gratitude, sort of, do you have a gratitude practice or do you do any types of meditation or things that really feed I your do. soul? Yeah, I do. I mean, um, I meditate on a pretty regular basis. It's very, uh, it, it couldn't be more simple. Like, I, you know, I don't have a mantra. I don't have a, you know, I just, I sit, I let the thoughts come and go. That's been incredibly powerful for me and incredibly healing. I do, I'm conscious of being, I, I, I work in gratitude. I mean, I, I've been given so much and I've come from such a tough place and I've had experience with uh, the more I cultivate gratitude, the, the happier I am and the better dad I am, the better worker I am. So uh, it's, it's kind of like a, it's a practice of, you know, just sort of kind of constant. It's almost like muscle memory now, which I'm grateful for. Of just looking around and saying, instead of like, oh, this is tough for why me? And I've said that for, I said that for a long time and it just was so painful. You know, kind of having that conscious, uh, looking around for gratitude because it's always there. Even in the hardest situations, there's always something to be grateful for. Um, and then I also realized that, or my sort of understanding is that the more that I help other people, the more I help myself. And it, it's in very little ways. I mean, I'm, I'm not curing cancer. I'm not out in the streets of Calcutta. But I do care about people. It's not just a job for me or it's not just sort of, you know, how much money I make. But there's, it's like a whole package um, that seems to work. It's such, a, it's such a beautiful thing. And I, I think um, we all need to really recognize where gratitude comes in and how it really gives more than, than it takes. And 
I'm curious, have you ever thought about having a gratitude practice around your technology or is ever that part of what you're grateful for? Am I grateful for the technology? No, 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 but I'm not, I'm not hating. I, I, I just look, it's like, I don't know. It's more like a tool, I guess. But, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that because Caroline and her mom have a gratitude practice where they email each other um, what they're grateful for every day. I'll have to talk to her about that. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, maybe it's just that FaceTime and the capability to be able to stay connected. Yeah, that's right. 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 That's right. That's so right. It may yeah. Be, it may be a tool, but that's a very intimate tool. Well, yeah. I mean, I can't think of something I use more than my phone every day, which is insane, you know, but it's true. Well, so have you ever named a car? Nah, no, I'm not really a car guy. I'm more of an experience guy. You're definitely an experience guy. Yeah. And yeah. It's something that I highly recommend for any of you listeners that are out there that want to add a little bit more joy and a little bit more excitement to your day, take a moment to check out Bill Springer's work. You can follow the links and the, the podcast notes or you can just check it out at Swizzle Sport Media or Ocean Home Mag. Don't go writing it down while you're driving, please. Don't worry. You can find it on the podcast notes, both in iTunes and on the website. And Bill, this has been such a pleasure having you join me today. I feel honored to have shared this, this time with you. And just I just am grateful for you and what you're doing. So thank you. Well, thank you, Heidi. And next one, I want to come and do it in person out there where you are. Absolutely. You can count okay. on that. Rain check. All right, good. For whenever, we're, okay. whenever you get here. So thank Great. you for joining us today on the Evolving Digital Self podcast. This has been an episode with Bill Springer, the editor-in-chief of Ocean Home Magazine and a dear, dear friend of mine. So glad you were here to join us. And don't forget to subscribe. Take a moment to rate and review and share with your friends. And we'll see you next time on the Evolving Digital Self podcast. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye for now. Thank you for joining us for the Evolving Digital Self. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app now so that you don't miss a single episode. While you're at it, please give us a rating and a review and join the digital self-mastery movement to create more conscious use of technology by sharing it and telling your friends. Want to see where you fit on the digital self spectrum and how it might be impacting your business and relationships? Get your free copy of Digital Self Mastery today by clicking on the link in the show notes.